Hey, hey, hey! This recording is designed to help you with the control of microorganisms um, for your microbiology class at Gadsden State. Okay, let's jump in. This first slide is just some terms that you'll want to be sure and know and word parts. And so as we go through, um, you'll be able to see these words in the rest of the PowerPoint, so you want to make sure you know what these words mean. So the first one is sterilization. Now this one is important because Sterilization means that it kills everything, even endospores. Maybe write that in. Everything is killed if you sterilize something. So I sterilize the orange biohazard bags that we use in lab. So when I take it out of the autoclave, it is sterilized. It means every bacteria, every virus, every endospore, everything is dead. Now disinfectant is, is not the same. So that, those are the most important things, the two words I want you to make sure you know. So sterilization kills everything. Disinfection kills, it says aims at destroying the vegetative or growing pathogens. It aims to destroy most. This is what we do to our countertops. We kill most of the organisms on our countertops. We don't kill everything. We can't. We don't have a, there's not a chemical that we could purchase to use on our countertops that we could kill everything with. So we kill most. Now, so that's the difference. Make sure you know the difference in sterilization and disinfectant. Sterilization kills everything. Disinfectant aims at destroying the pathogens, right? We want to kill the flu or the strep throat or the stomach virus that someone in our family has recently had. But we can't kill everything. We definitely does not kill, definitely does not kill endospores. Remember from the last exam, endospores is a highly resistant resting stage. Endospores can survive even 19 hours of boiling water. So, of course, it can survive a low Lysol on our countertops. Disinfection may be chemicals. It may be UV light. It may be boiling water and it may be steam. So those are just some examples of disinfection. Make sure that you know that boiling water is a disinfection. Boiling water does not kill endospores, so it is a disinfection, not a sterilant. Okay, two vocabulary words here. A disinfectant is a chemical that is applied to a non-living or inanimate object. Countertop, toilet, floors, handles, steering wheel, car, things like that. An antiseptic is a chemical that is applied to living tissue, body wash, toothpaste, um, mouthwash, shampoo, neosporin, something like that. So disinfectant is applied to inanimate objects, while antiseptic is applied to living tissues. Okay, deserming is... Um, Another term, and it is the chemical, I mean the mechanical removal. So this is like picking the mold off the bread and then making the sandwich. So re mechanical removal of the pathogen. Okay, sanitization, that's what they do in the hospitals. They lower the microbial count to safe public health levels. So cut back on the germs. And then these last ones are word parts. Anytime you see side or sidle in a word, it means to kill. Examples are germicide, fungicide, viricide, and bactericide. But an easy way to remember this is homicide or suicide. So anytime side is in a word, it means to kill. Stasis or static. We actually mentioned this with the last test about the refrigerator. So stasis or static is to halt or inhibit growth. So by putting a gallon of milk in the refrigerator, you're going to slow down the growth of the bacteria, right? It doesn't kill the bacteria. It just slows down or halts the growth. And then sepsis or septic is infected. It is contaminated. So um, by sterilizing the needle, the, the loops in lab, we are doing 
aseptic techniques. We are preventing bacterial contamination. Okay, so if sepsis is infected, this isn't in your notes, but I just added it, then aseptic would be preventing contamination, right? Um, we're going to use aseptic surgical gloves, sterile surgical gloves. They're, they're individually wrapped. So when you look at sterilized surgical gloves, the first term, they are individually wrapped. They're sterilized and they're used in surgery. The ones that we use in patient care in just the rooms, they come packaged all in a box. Uh, I would imagine it's much cheaper that way. And they are not sterile, but they are, you know, sanitized. Hopefully there's not any uh, pathogens in there. So aseptic techniques would be wearing gloves, you know, how we keep the lid on the Petri dish when we're not using it, things like that. Okay, these are just some factors which affect all... Um, so this PowerPoint is going to be divided into physical control and chemical control. So these are just some factors which which influence both. How well did it work? The physical control or the chemical control? The number of microbes. We know that it's easier to kill a few microbes than it is a large amount of microbes. It's easier to kill a small infection rather than a large infection. Environmental factors. Um, if the organism is in blood, like organic matter, or if the organism is in uh, feces, then that is going to contribute to the organism's ability to stay alive. It's harder to kill bacteria that's in feces or blood. It's much easier if it's just sitting on the counter. The temperature and the pH, of course, we know that bacteria prefer a certain temperature and pH. The time of exposure. So the next time you're um, cleaning your countertops or your floors, the chemical that you use, look at the back. How long does the chemical need to be exposed to the organism to kill it? And so some things say four minutes. Some things say ten seconds. So look at the chemical you're using and see how long does it take to kill the organisms. And then the type of microbes. Now remember, we wrote this in on the last test, or we had it on the last test, for type of organism, so we talked about the difference in gram-positive versus gram-negative. Okay, remember gram-positive has a thick peptidoglycan, thick cell wall. You know this. Gram-negative has a thin cell wall. and it has an outer membrane. Okay, but remember that gram-positive with their thick cell wall are going to be resistant to physical control. So they are resistant to physical control. Specifically, the physical control that we're going to do a lab with is UV light. So we're going to do a lab with that. They are sensitive. They don't have that outer membrane. So they are sensitive to chemicals. Opposite, gram-negative is resistant To chemicals. Think about it like they have that outer membrane, that fatty membrane. Remember um, lipoprotein, lipopolysaccharide fatty layer, phospholipid. So fat, fat, fat layer. So they are resistant to chemicals breaking through them. But because of their thin cell wall, they are sensitive to physical control. Okay, good. Okay, so the first couple we're going to discuss all deal with heat. So this is physical control dealing with heat. The first one is boiling. Know that boiling is a disinfectant. It's not a sterilant. 
It's a disinfectant. It kills it, like the first slide said, it aims at killing the vegetative cells. It really, it really kills everything except the endospores in as little as 10 minutes. So doesn't kill endospores. Does not kill endospores. <clears throat> Autoclaving. Now look at those numbers. This is a sterilization. That's what we use here at Gaston State, and I've got a picture on the next slide. Autoclaving is a sterilization. That means it kills everything, even endospores. Look at that time. Look at that those numbers. 21 degrees past boiling, so 100 is boiling. So a temperature of 121, a pressure of 15 psi. So that's a unit of pressure. It's about 300 pounds or so. And then in as little as 15 minutes, it kills everything. But there's temperature, moisture, pressure, and size that are all drawbacks. So you can't autoclave your cell phone because of the temperature and the moisture and the pressure. You can't autoclave your bed mattress because of the size. So the drawbacks to the autoclave. Um, the, the autoclave is maybe two foot by two foot in size and so what we do is we pour water right here in the back you can see oops that was supposed to be that you can see there I pour water set it to 121 degrees Celsius 15 pressure for 15 minutes now screw the, the lid closed the door closed and anything that comes out of the autoclave is dead anything any bacteria, any virus, even, you know, think the worst virus ever, the worst bacteria ever, the, the biggest, strongest endospore, everything is dead. Okay, so dry heat, this kills everything. This is a sterilant. Of course, you can't dry ever. You can't flame everything because then whatever you're trying to flame is gone. If you were trying to flame your watch or something. So burning contaminants to ashes. This is an example of how we do the inoculating loop. So you've done this. Um, hold it at a 45 degree angle until it turns bright orange. Then all the organisms on that, even endospores, because this is a sterilant, are dead. Incineration really is the, the same thing as direct heat. You're burning something to ashes. Okay, so that's a sterilant. And then hot air sterilization is also a sterilant. Look at the temperature, 170 degrees, so way past boiling, 70 degrees past boiling for as long, for three hours. So it takes a really long time to use hot air sterilization. Of course, drawbacks are going to be longer time. Remember, the autoclave only took 15 minutes and high temperatures. So it is very effective. Hot air sterilization is very effective. We know about pasteurization. This is Lewis Pasteur's method to keep things um, on the shelf longer, to have a longer shelf life, like milk or yogurt or things like that. Uh, beer and wine are pasteurized. So only 72 degrees, so not even boiling, for as little as 15 seconds. So just, I mean, just a run it under some warm water for just a second. 72 degrees Celsius, 15, 15 seconds is pasteurizing and so if you heat up the milk for 72 degrees for 15 seconds it's going to reduce not kill it's going to reduce the number of organisms so that the milk will stay good on the shelf longer that's it filtrating removes microbes by passage through a screen of course solids can't be filtered so this is used on liquids and gases but this wasn't very effective because small microbes like viruses could pass through the filtration pores, so it wasn't very good. Okay, cold. We mentioned refrigerator on the last exam. Refrigerator is a bacteria static. Remember, that means it halts or inhibits growth. So it slows down the bacteria by decreasing their metabolism. And that way, whatever's in the refrigerator, think about the raw chicken or milk, um, even fruit or vegetables, whatever is in the refrigerator will stay good longer because the bac uh, bacteria is static. 
deep freezing just does a little bit more. So that's putting something in the freezer or the deep freezer. You know what that is. It's just going to be a bacteria static also. And then lyophilization, this is different. It removes the water. So it dehydrates something. Um, you see there below that's uh, astronaut ice cream. Have you ever had the neoprene astronaut ice cream? That, uh, that the water is gone out of it. So all of those were bacteria statics. Okay, osmotic pressure. Remember that bacteria are 80 to 90% water. So they've got to have water. If they were packaged in salt, then the osmotic pressure uh, would be too high. They would lose water. Um, this is used in food preservation. And we mentioned a little bit about uh, salt and sugar being used to preserve honey-baked hams and things like that on the last exam. Okay, physical control still, and we're talking about light. This, one, this is the one we're going to do the lab with. So make sure that you know that light is a form of physical control. Okay, so there's two types of radiation for light. There is ionizing radiation, which has a short wavelength, high energy, fear of cancer. So think about x-rays is the, the one that comes to mind. Um, Non-ionizing radiation has a longer wavelength, low energy, and does not penetrate well. When I think of this, um, well, we're going to do a lab that's going to help us have a specific example. We're going to hold the bacteria plates or place them underneath the light for uh, control and see if it actually does kill the bacteria. This is used in surgery rooms, over the utensils, and it's also used in buffets for food bars. But also think about the tanning bed. Um, it does not penetrate well. So if you wear undergarments in the tanning bed, you're going to get tan lines, which I don't recommend going to the tanning bed. But anyway, so, but we know that radiation damages DNA. Radiation damages DNA. Um, the radiation wavelength best for damaging DNA, write this in, is 260 nanometers. That's the wavelength best for damaging DNA. So if you look at this picture, it kind of goes through um, the different wavelengths. So 260, it, I think it even tells you on the slot, on this picture. Yeah, bactericidal right over here. This is where bacteria are killed and 260 is best for damaging DNA. And so the light that we're going to use is non-ionizing radiation. And that's a control for phys that's a physical control. It kills DNA. So write these things in. This is right from the lab book. Let's write these things in. So factors that affect how well the light works. Factors, and you're going to learn most of these in the lab. The first one is going to be the type of organism. Is it gram positive or is it gram negative? Remember that gram positive should be resistant to physical, while gram negative should be sensitive. The second one is direct exposure. It said on that last slide that the organism had to be in direct contact because it did not penetrate well. Time it's under the light. Does one mat one minute make a difference between ten minutes? Did, did ten minutes under the light work better than only one minute? And then the fourth one we won't learn in lab, um, but it makes sense. The distance from the light. If it's right up under the light, or if the light's across the room, does it matter? So these are factors which affect how well the light controls microorganisms.